Hey everybody, it's Nathaniel Avila reporting from San Antonio, and I'm here with Timbrel Hildebrand reporting from uh, um, where I'm in Crowley right now. Crowley right now. Back to Arlington. Okay. Um, oh, uh, when you get married, are you gonna keep the name Hildebrand, or are you gonna change it? I, I am gonna change it. I'm gonna change it to his name. Okay. Uh, what what is it? So I can like memorize it. it it's a uh, Cheapers. Timbrel Cheebers? Yeah, I'm still getting used to it. For right now, let's just stick with Hildebrand. Okay, sounds good. So, uh, what are we talking about today? Uh, Tron, the OG from 1986. Yeah, we were, we uh, talked about the the long-awaited sequel to Tron uh, a bit a while ago. And now this one was like actually filmed in 1982. So this was like way back like when like <clears throat> before like cgi became like a mainstay so this film was very revolutionary in its like trying to make everything <laughs> filmed on a green screen am i right yeah it's pretty extraordinary given the time period mm -hmm. so let's talk about the background of tron and it's it's a lot so, uh, so apparently the story started in, back in 1976 when uh, Steven Lesberger, who was then an animation animator of drawings at, with his own studio, um, looked at a sample reel from the computer firm called Magi um, and saw Pong for the first time. And that's when he was inspired for the film Tron. So he was immediately fascinated by video games and wanted to do a film incorporating them. So according to Lisberger, uh, this is this is his words, uh, I realized that there were these techniques that could be very suitable for bringing video games and computer visuals to the screen. And that was the moment that the whole concept flashed across my mind. Um, now, a lot of people like associate like the first video game movie being like the Super Mario Brothers that was filmed back in the 1990s um, and it was considered to be like a massive flop and basically destroyed reputations for video game movies um, but Tron was I think was a lot earlier uh, but it, it wasn't a movie based on a video game but it was mostly like a movie about video games um, in a sense so uh, Lisberger had already created an early version of the character, uh, Tron, for a 30-second animation which was used to promote both the Lisberger Studios and a series of various clock radio stations. Oh, rock radio stations. Um, this blacklit cell animation depicted Tron as a character who glowed yellow, uh, the same shade that Lisberger had originally intended for all the heroic her characters developed for the feature-length film. So this was later changed to blue for the finished film. Um, so the, and also the prototype Tron was, uh, actually had a beard and he resembled the Cylon Centurions on the original 1978 TV show Battlestar Galactica. Um, also Tron was armed with two exploding discs as Lisberger described them in the two disc DVD edition. So Lisberger elaborates, uh, and this is his words. So everyone was doing backlit animation in the 1970s. Uh, it was that disco look, and we thought that if we had this character, it was a neon line. And uh, that was our Tron warrior. Tron for Electronic. Uh, so that's where the name Tron came from. It was supposed to be like an excerpt from for Electronic. And uh, what happened was I saw Pong, and I said, well, that's the arena for him. And at the same time, I was interested in the early phases of computer-generated animation, which I got into MIT in Boston. And when I got into that, I met a bunch of programmers who were into all of that. They really inspired me in how much they believed in this new realm. So <clears throat> he was frustrated by the click-like nature of computers and video games and wanted to create a film that would open the world up to everyone. Les Berger and his business partner, Donald Kushner, moved to the West Coast in 1977 and set up an animation studio to develop Tron. They burrowed against the anticipated profits of their 90-minute animated television special, um, Animal, <laughs> Animal Olympics, uh, to develop storyboards for Tron, uh, with the notion of making an animated film. But after uh, Variety mentioned the project briefly during its early phase, it caught the attention of computer scientist Alan Kay. 
he contacted Lesberger and convinced him to use him as an advisor in the movie. When persuaded him to use real CGI instead of just hand animation. Bonnie McBird wrote the first drafts of Tron with extensive input from Lisberger. Basing the original personality of Alan on Alan Kay, uh, he gave her and Lisberger the same tour of Xerox Park that famously inspired the Apple Macintosh computer. And their many conversations uh, and a clash he took with uh, Donald uh, Knuth at Stanford. So, uh, inspired her to include many computer science references. As a result of working together, Kay and McBird became close and later married. So that's a love story for the ages. Uh, she also created Tron as a character rather than a visual demo and Flynn. Uh, originally, McBird envisioned Flynn more comically, suggesting that the then 30-year-old Robin Williams for the role. Besides, Many story changes after the script went to Disney, including giving it a more serious tone with quasi-religious overtones and removing most of the scientific elements. None of their dialogue remains in the final film. Yeah. And there was rather bitter critics dispute. Uh, that's unfortunate. So the film was eventually conceived as an animated film bracketed with live action sequences. The rest involved a combination of computer-generated visuals and black-lit animation. Lisberger planned to finance the movie independently by approaching several computer companies but had little success. However, one company, Information International Incorporated, was receptive. He met with Richard Taylor, a representative, and they began talking about using live-action photography with backlit animation in such a way that would be integrated with computer graphics. At this point, there was a script and the film was entirely storyboarded, with some computer animation tests completed. He had spent approximately $300,000 developing Tron and also secured four to five million dollars in private backing before reaching a standstill. Lisberger and Kushner took their storyboards and samples of computer generated films to Warner Brothers, MGM, and Columbia, all of which turned them down. In 1980, they decided to take their idea to Walt Disney, which was interested in producing more daring productions at the time. So Tom, we Tom uh, Weheit, uh, Disney's vice president for creative development, watched Lid Lidsberger's test footage and convinced Ron Miller to give the movie a chance. Um, Ron Miller being the, uh, I think he was the CEO at the time, and he was also, uh, I believe he's also Walt Disney's son-in-law. So, however, uh, Disney's uh, executives were uncertain about giving 10 to $12 million to a first-time producer and director using techniques which, in most cases, have never been attempted. The studio agreed to finance a test reel, which involved a flying disc champion throwing a rough prototype of the discs used in the film. It was a chance to mix live-action footage with a backlit animation and computer-generated visuals. It impressed the executives at Disney, and they agreed to back the film. McBird and Lisberger's script was subsequently rewritten and restoryboarded with the studio's input. At the, at the time, Disney rarely hired outsiders to make films for them, and Kushner found that he and his group were given a chilly reception because they tackled the nerve center, the animation department. They saw them as the gem germ from outside. We tried to enlist several Disney animators, but none came. Disney is a closed group. As a result, they hired Wang Film Productions for the animation. And thus, that's the story of Tron. Very extensive. Wow. Yeah. What is very interesting to me that is that Disney did not animate the film because they were like, ah, oh, this guy's an outsider. We don't, do, we don't take well to strangers around these parts. So they just yeah, got it. surprises me. Yeah. So they just uh, got another t team to just do the animation bit. So that's okay. Well, they did a good job. So yeah, jokes on them. Yeah, high f uh, claps all around. Uh, so whatever, our, what's our initial thoughts of Tron? I really liked this movie. I hadn't seen it until recently. Like I'd seen it. Uh, I watched it. Uh, I want to say like I watched it around the time when we did that first. Uh, Tron thing, so I think that was like during the summer maybe, um, 
And I'd never seen it. My dad was always like, oh, you know, you have to watch Tron. You're a filmmaker. You need to watch Tron. It's like, it, it, it looks like it's bad effects, but it's not because for the time period, you know, stuff like that. And I was really intrigued with not just the the, the, the effects, but also like the, the story itself. I thought the religious imagery was very interesting. Um, I thought it was particularly interesting that they were using this technological world with this religious imagery, which you don't usually put together in a story and stuff like that. So I, I thought that was really neat. And um, it feels a lot like an 80s movie in that like some of the story feels a little bit like, I don't know how to explain it. It's like there's not as much character development. It's like the story is more focused on the plot, I guess. But um, I think it works. It's, it's really, I think it's really interesting. And I'm glad they went with a more serious tone. I enjoy that. Yeah, um, so you say, like, uh, religious imagery and religious uh, undertones. Like, what religious imagery have you seen, have you noticed in it? Well, I guess it wouldn't be so much imagery as it is, like, the whole theme of the film. The idea of, like, the users and the program. Like, the programs are designed by the users. And that, I think that points pretty much directly to the belief in God. Like, you know, at the very beginning, the program gets captured or whatever and he's talking to another program he goes you believe in the users he goes well yeah then uh, if there's not our user then who wrote me you know and uh i, I really like that because um i mean i would say that like you know i you know there's a god because he created me and he, he wrote me quote unquote in a sense so i i think that's really that, that was really neat how they were kind of they were deemed this they were religious extremists because they believed they were users. So I thought I thought that was really neat because it had a faith element to it. Yeah, and then they also they say like, oh, uh, like oh, you're another religious nut to people who say things like that. And yeah, do you think that's like a commentary on like religious persecution? I don't know. I do find it surprising that um, that a film like this would take would would make it that way. So I. I I mean, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it kind of it's hard for me to not get to that conclusion because it seems to me like the uh, people who don't believe in said users, aka, I, if you want to say like atheists, or take over, t- took over the state, or people who are non-religious took over the state of the grid, and now they are finding people who um, believe in the users, and then making them force them to play in these gladiatorial games um yeah so it's kind of like it, it it's kind of difficult for me to not come to that conclusion when people are like so when they have lines like oh you're another religious nut coming in uh and <clears throat> so what do you think about like the mcp what is his deal in the entire film in terms of like the religious aspect who is he just he's kind of the main antagonist Mm -hmm. you know so i don't know i don't know really what he'd be considered necessarily in regard to like the i think he just he represents he represents sort of like i guess the oppressing the oppressive force against the users and stuff like that um i don't i don't really know what he represents he's an interesting villain because you don't really see him he's just kind of there right um i guess you can say like maybe i don't know i'm I'm just really thinking about this religious aspect because it's very prominent in this film like um and then we have like flynn who is a user who is deflected as like a divine being um who becomes like one with the programs and he lives among them for a bit in order to Uh rescue them from the mcp who is i'm I can only assume is like is like uh this is definitely the antagonist of the film and i can't help but like make these religious comparisons when watching this film uh so moving on from the whole religious aspect let's move on to the more technical aspects of this film and like the whole cgi thing so what do we feel about that i think it's really neat to look at because they were really pushing the envelope for what was done at that time and uh that's that's pretty cool i think because you know obviously it doesn't look as good as the stuff we're doing now um but for back then like that was really impressive like if they hadn't taken that first step to try to get the cgi out there we might not have what we have right now Mm -hmm. um and 
Yeah, I thought it was neat. Um, the, the CGI, yeah, I mean, it definitely looks like old CGI, but I think what was most impressive to me was, like, the costumes, all the lights and stuff like that, the real reflective, like, just what they were doing with the lights. That was really cool. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, I really like this film because I know it's supposed to be, like, a, like an old video game style, and it definitely does reflect that a whole lot. Um, and when I watch this, I'm not like thinking like, ah, this is garbage CGI. I'm thinking like, oh, this looks like a 1980s video game, which makes sense because that's what it's supposed to be. And yeah. I do find it really charming, like in a retro aspect, because it has also those grid lines that you see and those like vapor wave stuff that you see. And I think it's like also pretty cool. And I know that also Disney became like is a, is probably the perfect studio to do this because I know that they're also very uh, experimental at times. I guess it also depends on who's in charge, but they do have like they're all they they do a lot of experimental stuff because I know there's also like that point in time where Disney just was like had like a huge experimental phase and just did like a bunch of experiments like back to back to back and like it was like a series of. Of films that were the first of something um so it would make sense that that disney would take a chance on this film uh and make like a, a film uh where it was mostly filmed on like a sound stage or with a bunch of green screens and it's funny because they that's all they do now <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> like like we should do the lion king live action by live action no, i mean no uh... live action <laughs> And oh, don't get me started on Marvel. That's all they do. <laughs> so yeah, so that's what we got doing. Cause it's definitely a, a testament to its time. Uh, so uh, what do we? Okay, so like, well, who would you say the protagonist of this film is? That is a great question because you know the movie is called Tron. Mm -hmm. So you would think that the character Tron would be the main character. It's really quite a roller coaster that you get here because you don't even really get introduced to Tron as a character until like 20, 30 minutes into the movie. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I would say that Flynn is the main character because most of the plot seems to revolve around him. You know, like the catalyst is him going into the game and traveling through the game is the main thing. Um, yeah, I think, I think I'd say that's he's the main character. But Tron is also a big character. Yeah. Uh, I would definitely, like, in terms of, like, definition, a protagonist is the person whose goal moves the story forward. Yeah. So I suppose Tron is the protagonist because his goal is to, what, destroy the MCP? Or is it Flynn because his, his goal is to go home? No. Well, the thing is, Flynn didn't know he needed to go home till his memories came back. I don't know. It is hard to say. Yeah. I'd still say Flynn is probably the main character. Yeah, he's okay. in the majority of the film. Yeah, let's talk. Let's let's go with Flynn. So, what do we think about uh, Jeff Bridges' performance as Flynn? I love Jeff Bridges. He's great. I, I've never seen a movie with Jeff Bridges in it that I didn't like. Mm -hmm. Jeff Bridges in it, you know, like. It, it could be a bad movie, but I'll still like Jeff Bridges in it. Yeah, even, um, even what was it, R.I.P.D.? Remember that film? Oh, I never saw it. Okay. <laughs> that was a bad movie. Pretty but, bad? Yeah. Well, okay, I, I'll skip it. Okay, but, sounds uh, good. Okay, what happened? So, what, what else you got for uh, Bridges? What is your opinion? Him. I, I thought he brought a very nice comedic element to it. Honestly, he just looked like he was having the time of his life being in this movie. But what I thought was interesting is for a movie like this, you know, this wasn't the days where a lot of movies were being shot where you were expected to just act in front of a, you know, a blank screen and kind of imagine everything. You know, that wasn't quite as common or really common at all. Um, so it was really interesting to see him pretty he, he gave it quite a bit of his like because uh, i mean jeff Bridges is a great actor you watch him in anything you'll see how talented he is um but i i really saw his acting chops in this when this could have easily been something where someone fell completely flat and well, i mean i'm not saying this performance is oscar worthy or anything in many cases he's just kind of a goofball but i i thought it was interesting that he brought some of his dramatic chops to this to the table as well as some of his comedic ones I, I think it made it really interesting 
Yeah. It it kind of gave me it made me feel like uh like kind of Harrison Forty, a bit. I can see that. Yeah. Only a little bit more joy. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, you got that right. Um. So and then also was Clue in this film? The thing is, yeah, I guess Clue was the thing at the beginning that got destroyed. The oh. Jeff Bridges that was like in the computer as his program. Mm-hmm. But then somehow he must have come back because he's the bad guy in the sequel. Yeah. Prequel. Sequel. It's a sequel. It's not a prequel. Yeah. So he comes... I know, yeah, he comes back in the sequel. He was the main villain in that film, and he's like uh, a very poorly CGI de Jeff Bridges, and it looks like a PS2. But if you think about character. it, like, if they had made everyone look like crappy CGI in the world, then it all would have matched, and it would have made sense because it was like, you know the mid 2000s and the cgi wasn't quite what it could be yet ah uh, now that's the out there yeah Sorry, i'm digressing but <laughs> yeah i loved jeff bridges in this i i liked his outside of the video game character and it was interesting to see him go on the inside and still be himself but you know he's all shiny and stuff that was that was neat mm-hmm so um okay so another thing is like what do you think like the the use of colors in this film represents because we have blue meaning good and then we have red meaning bad what do you think that means i mean i'd say it's a fairly um common uh top common color scheme in regard to what it means thematically um i mean you look at star wars you see the same thing you know you got the blue lightsabers and the red lightsabers at least in the original movies that's what the original thing was Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I guess just you know, you think of red. Red is just kind of associated with the bad guy. You rarely ever think red and think good guys. I mean, there's a reason that in every movie, you know, when you hit the button that like blows up everything, it's always red. It's never green. It's never blue. It's always red. Right, and I know, like, yeah, because red is also considered to be like a uh, like a like a color of anger. Yeah, and it's kind of like violent, kind of ish. And blue is considered a more calming color, a more tranquil color, kind of like the ocean. Um, so we also have that going on. What do we think about Bro- Bruce Boxleiter as Tron in this film? Who know? Uh, his name is Bruce Boxleitner. That's his, That's the person who played Tron. Oh, that is an awesome name. <laughs> I really liked him. I thought he really fit the whole stereotypical superhero look. Like, he was out for the good of the team. Like, you know, you have um, Jeff Bridges' character, Flynn, and he's a little bit more a little bit more of a rascal, you know. He's okay with doing things the underhanded way in order to get his and stuff like that. Um, but uh, but um, what's his name? Uh, Tron or Alan in the real world. Like, he's very much like the straight-laced, we're going to do things right kind of guy. And Tron's kind of similar. Like, he just has that look, you know. He's very much a superhero type and I like that. He's he he fits what Tron is supposed to be, I think. Right. And I believe we also have a death in this film. Uh I don't remember who it was. Oh, Ram. Yeah. Ram. It was sad. Yeah, Ram who is played by Dan Shore, um ends up dying in this film. So what do you what do you think about the death scene in this in this film? Cuz he dies in uh Flynn's arms. Yeah, honestly, I I think it was pretty touching because Ram, like, he sort of is, he has, even though he's not in that much of the movie, whenever he's on screen, you can see this kind of glimmer of hope in his eyes. Like, he hopes and he has faith in the users and, like, he has faith in his greater purpose and, you know, like, he, he kind of, he has a bit of brightness in his eyes, I suppose, and it's really, and he's kind of like the younger guy in the group, obviously. Um, so it was really kind of heartbreaking to watch him die in Flynn's arms but also it was somewhat satisfying to see that like he got to see a user and stuff like that and so he was satisfied and okay like when he passed away but it was still it was so sad because he had a lot of heart and then they killed him I just it hurts my heart to watch him like oh Ram <laughs> no Ram you're dis- you're <laughs> disappearing into thin air and um yeah and it also believe i believe it also gives uh flynn the motivation to actually defeat the mcp uh, um besides just wanting to get out now his motivation has changed to defeating the mcp as well yeah um, so i agree yeah so who was the person who ultimately defeated the mcp was it tron or was it flynn i think it was 
was a collaborative effort because mm-hmm. Flynn jumped into the beam thing so that he could throw the disc and block it. Right. So it seems like, yeah, it seems like a collaborative thing. <laughs> All right. So, and then so Tron had to go and he had to send his dick, not uh, his disc, up to uh, Alan. Was that the whole thing? Yeah, that was the money shot where he, like, transferred all the stuff and, you know, he holds the disc up. Yeah, and then he then he trans- transfers all the stuff and then the day is saved. Hooray! Well, yeah, but then he has to, like, throw the disc and block the master whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, as, also, we have the other character who is Sark, who is supposed to be, like, the commander of the bad programs. Um, who is played by David Warner, who I believe also plays the MCP. What do we think about Sark as a character? Um, he's, he's, he's cool. I mean, he's very much, he's sort of a pawn, you know, like the master, uh, master program is clearly the one pulling all the strings, but, um, he's like his puzzle. He's his little like chess piece trying to get him to, you know, do the dirty work, I suppose. Right. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it worked because, like, you could tell he was very weak, you know. Ultimately, he was just as terrified as the master program and even of the users, you know. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't nearly the tough guy that he made himself out to be, which was, I think, gives him a little bit more depth as a villain than someone who has absolutely no reservations about themselves. Right. Uh, excuse me. And so and also, I believe, um, I believe he was defeated in the beginning, uh, near the end of the film and then the mcp just like we're gonna make him grow bigger like in like a star like a power rangers villain and and then and then that happens um <laughs> and then so uh yeah so we have a lot of very fleshed out in death characters in this film uh i believe there was also a woman character uh yori um, yeah, it was Yori when she was in the video game, and I think her name was Laura in real life. Right. Now, what do we think about her character? I mean, honestly, I feel like she's kind of a throwaway character. I mean, she's more of a plot point than a character. Like, they just kind of... Like, honestly, they didn't really need her for the story. It was, like, I hate to say it, like, it does kind of frust- me, frustrate me a little bit, but it kind of feels like she was quote unquote window dressing, you know, they just like needed a girl character in there. So they're like, Oh, let's just, uh, let's just stick her in there. You know, like, right. I would have liked to see more of her character. Cause you, they, they, you open up and you meet this character and she seems like she's very intelligent. You know, she's in charge of this high tech technology that they're designing and stuff. Um, and that was really cool. Like I, I enjoyed her character more in the real world than the one in the, uh, cause the one in the real world, at least, um, you know, she she had a little bit more of a purpose. We got to know her a little bit more. The one in the other, I guess the other one, like, didn't really have much personality. She was just kind of there to kind of facilitate what was happening. So I feel like, yeah, she, she didn't feel like a super important character, but I feel like she could have been if they would given her a little bit more meat, right? so to speak. Yeah, and so do you think that this uh, Tron actually kind of, fell flat in terms of female characters oh yeah i definitely say that but i mean like that, that's the thing like if there wasn't room for her they just shouldn't have put her in there right that's, that's just my thing like i mean i would have been fine if it had just been about tron and uh what's his name uh uh flynn, flynn. yeah it was just about t- tron and flynn like going around and kicking butt it's just I guess she had a purpose because, like, she was showing them where to go. You know, she was kind of like the guide, for lack of a better word. But mm. I don't know. She, I felt like they, if they were going to put her in, they should have made her a little bit. Like, it would have felt weird without her there. But at the same time, she didn't really add that much to the story either. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think they also tried to, like, make up for that in the sequel with the character of Cora, who was portrayed by yeah. Olivia Wilde. Um, so, like... <clears throat> oh, and also then Tron ends up becoming like a bounty hunter uh, in the sequel. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was... That didn't really... I, I don't know. That kind of ruins Tron's character. Like, when you see how awesome he is in this one, you know? Yeah. kind of ruins it in the sequel. Yeah, like, how did you become, like, this really cool, like, 
hero figure to like a, a like a bounty like a like a like a ruthless bounty hunter in the sequel. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was. Yeah, you just don't think about it too hard. Okay. It, it, it doesn't help. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and then we have uh, all these very good fleshed out characters. Um, good, pretty much revolutionary CGI and like special effects. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to talk about this uh, film with? Um, I mean, it's just it's a cool movie. I think it's a really cool movie, and um, it has interesting like it has an interesting plot. It's very like complex for the movie that it is. Like you wouldn't expect a movie of this magnitude to have the deeper themes that it has, and I think that's pretty neat. Yeah. And uh, I believe that they're making a third film soon. I'm not 100 really? percent sure. Yeah, I don't okay. know. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, let's but... see. Uh, have you ever watched the show? You know what? I watched a little of it, but I never finished it. I think I watched maybe like two episodes, and then I was just kind of like, eh. But also, I was really young, so I probably didn't really get what was happening or yeah. care. So. <laughs> Yeah, and I believe that, like there's only 19 episodes, so it got canceled. Yeah, it got quick. canceled. Yeah, so yeah, that's that. That is Tron for you. What would you What would you give this film? Um, I'd give it like an eight out of ten, probably. It's a, yeah, I think it's a pretty good movie, I, and I wouldn't give it like any higher than that because while I like the story, it's still relatively weak, but like it has really interesting themes, so I still enjoy it a lot. Right. I would uh, give this film a 7 out of 10. That seems fair. Yeah, I think that's fair too. Um, so yeah, that that's Tron for you. And we'll, we'll, that's, that's, that's that. <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to A Vision Podcast, home of Wacky Talkies, The Kingdom, Evil Exists, and many more.